about decision making, but I'll actually uh, start uh, by trying to address uh, some more global problems, uh, more closely related to, um, to some of the larger issues that this conference is intended to, uh, to address. So I'll, I'll start with the question that you all have in your program. Um, when, how, uh, when, where, how, and why did organisms input out the functions become conscious input output functions? But instead of addressing that question directly, um, I want to ask a different question first. Uh, and that is, why input output functions? Why are we um, <clears throat> describing, why are we phrasing this question in this particular way? And you might say, well, of course, what other way is there uh, really to think about the brain? <clears throat> because our, our general view of behavior, really, is that it is a uh, process that uh, turns sensory input into motor output. So in the words of uh, William James, the whole neural organism, it will be remembered, is physiologically considered by the machine, but a machine for converting stimuli into reactions. So then the question of, <clears throat> really, of, of psychology and neuroscience is what, what's here? What is it? What are the processes that take sensory input and produce motor output? And the general um, <clears throat> uh, answer to this, I think, is that it consists, this process consists of three different kinds of processes. Uh, perceptual processes, which take sensory input and produce some kind of representation of the world. Cognitive processes, which use this representation together with our memories of past experience, our current goals, etc., to make decisions and, and plan actions, <clears throat> and then produce some kind of representation of a motor plan, which is then executed by the action system through, um, through, a motor con uh, through movement, through muscle contraction. So behavior as a whole is seen as an analysis of the world, followed by deliberation and planning, followed by execution of the plan, or we sense the world, we think about it, and then we act upon it. Now, <clears throat> this is, of course, highly simplified. Of course, there's more to this. These arrows may be bidirectional. You can sometimes skip cognition, etc. So this is, of course, a highly simplified story. But nevertheless, I think it's very influential. And, and what I mean is it influences almost everything about brain science. It provides a taxonomy for university courses, textbooks, journals, etc., uh, academic departments. Um, but most importantly, scientists. Some people will, will classify themselves as perceptual sci sci uh, scientists or action sci scientists and not address these other parts of the system. <clears throat> um, now, since this is so influential, I think it's useful to ask, um, who do we cite for this? Uh, where does this view actually originate? Um, and I think it's, uh, of course, extremely old. And I really would say uh, that it originates from dualism. So now, <clears throat> when the, with the idea that there's a non-physical mind, uh, an old philosophical idea dating at least back to the ancient Greeks, um, this, this concept of a non-physical mind living in a, in a physical world forces us to conceive of two interfaces between uh, the world and the mind. So perception is that which presents the world to our internal non-physical mind. And action is that which plays out the free will of the mind onto the physical world. <clears throat> and um, philosophers such as Descartes um, pointed these kinds of things out. Uh, and then when psychology was conceived as a study, it was a study of the psyche, of this non-physical mind. The, the basic idea was that um, <clears throat> regardless of the fact that it's non-physical, we can still study it um, scientifically. And so the first study of, of uh, the, the first official school of psychology was Wilhelm Wundt's um, structuralism, which studied this non-physical thing through very careful introspection. <clears throat> now, that was in the late 19th century. Uh, 19th century. In the early 20th century, um, behaviorists said, to paraphrase, stop all this metaphysical nonsense. That we can't, we can't just um, study these things that we have no uh, physical evidence for. Um, we need to study things that we can test in the lab. <clears throat> and they suggested um, that perception and action are directly linked. You don't need some kind of uh, non-physical entity here. Um, and that what the subject matter for psychology really should be what are these linkages and how are they established through learning laws. And this was a very persuasive argument because of the earlier work of physiologists such as Pavlov, Thorndike, etc., who described these laws uh, in great detail. <clears throat> and other behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner went so far as to say that all of human behavior can be explained through these kinds of 
um, sensory motor linkages, associations established through reinforcement learning, etc. Um, but by the <clears throat> middle of the 20th century, this view started running out of steam as more and more uh, people had proposed um, reasons why this can't be the whole story. This was not sufficient to explain many kinds of behavior. And some behaviors, such as Tolman, um, suggested that you need to have internal processes. Rats appear to solve problems in such a way that they must have something. They must have some knowledge of the surroundings, a cognitive map that they use to perform the kinds of actions they do. There must be some internal processes. <clears throat> but of course, what are they? We didn't want to go back to a non-physical mind. Um, and so what was proposed is that this is cognition. This is what, uh, how we build the knowledge and how we use knowledge. The problem, of course, was, well, what is this cognition? We want it to be a purely physical process. Um, we didn't want to go back to this idea of, of some non-physical soul or something. Um, and the answer was actually provided from, um, of course, uh, information theory. Um, and information processing, the idea that what goes on here is information processing. And we use the definition normally, uh, most people use the definition of information um, defined by uh, Shannon's uh, information theory. And the definition of processing defined, of course, by Alan Turing. And so this provided a very nice way of answering this question. How can we have this thing here um, that is physical and yet can perform these functions? The idea that cognition is a computational process. And this was at the heart of many influential theories of things like uh, our spoken language, as well as the internal language of thought um, that we seem to be uh, conscious of. So this really led to what is the computational view of the brain. And I'm sure many people in this room um, uh, consider this to be a relatively well-established um, idea. Um, <clears throat> and it really suggests that a, a kind of a computer metaphor for cognition. Cognition is like computation. It's the rule-based manipulation of a variety of different kinds of representations. And this was very um, uh, impressive because it could explain a very advanced problem-solving behavior such as chess play. Um, <clears throat> it also led to a particularly interesting um, analogy that one could make regarding consciousness, that perhaps the mind is to the brain like the software is to the hardware of a computer. And perhaps that is why these things appear so different. Um, now, this was important because it suggested that studies of mental phenomena may be conducted independently of studies of brain physiology. Uh, just as you can understand the algorithm of a word processor without knowing much about the, the transistors, you should be able to understand the, the, the mind, the, the psychological processes going on without necessarily knowing much about neurons and neurotransmitters. So this gave psychologists less to worry about. It also allowed progress at a time where not much was known yet about the brain. Um, and also, it reflected uh, conveniently the historical separation between the studies of psychology and biology, often done in different departments and different faculties. So <clears throat> it let people uh, keep their subject matter um, that they historically grew up with. So um, one of the central ideas here is, of course, manipulation of representations of the world, etc. cetera. Um, and one can conceive of many different kinds of representations. Uh, what I'd like to um, classify these as what one could call descriptive representations. What I mean by this is um, representations that capture knowledge about the world or about the organism or about something else. So the basic idea is that these representations are describing something. There's something that they stand for. Um, and they should be explicit in the sense that they can be encoded and decoded and used by various systems to pass around this knowledge. They should be objective. If you're describing as part of the external world, it should be accurate to that external reality, capture the information that's relevant without being contaminated by other information like internal states. So you should be able to represent a, a bottle of water without reference to whether you're thirsty or not. Examples of this would be a reconstructed visual image, um, perhaps a 3D map of the world that you can use to navigate through it, labeled objects such as bottle, uh, Wolf Singer, Chair, etc., um, to understand the world around us. Um, also, perhaps a representation of desired path through space to reach at something that we're interested in. So these are the kinds of things that a lot of people have studied, uh, and David Marr was particularly influential in understanding how we could 
create knowledge or representation of uh, the, the visual world. <clears throat> so the, the reason these are important, I think, is because these descriptive representations um, are really the borders, the conceptual borders between different processes in the brain. Um, so if you pass some information from one system to another, it means that there must be some border between the systems. Um, the, a, a conceptual border between the processes that generate or construct these representations and the processes that use them. And of course, I just want to point out that in this case, we, uh, when people uh, make such, a, uh, such an observation, they're usually talking about input-output processes um, that are doing this. <clears throat> so it's a very sort of underlying concept of this input process output. Now, in, um, despite this traditional separation, um, in, in recent decades, people have become interested in, in trying to understand the brain um, from the perspective of some of these concepts. So cognitive neuroscience is an exciting field which is looking at how, uh, trying to answer how the psychological and cognitive functions that psychologists have discovered are actually produced by the brain. Where are they? What are the mechanisms? Um, so for example, decision making is one kind of uh, function that a lot of people are studying. <clears throat> And mostly, these studies are based on the concepts of cognitivism, the idea that the brain is doing computations, the idea that it's manipulating these descriptive representations. Um, we have concepts such as working memory, attentional filters, et cetera, motor programs, et cetera, to try to understand the brain. Um, and <clears throat> so what I want to sort of um, ask is how is this, how, is, how are we doing? How, how is this project going of trying to understand the brain using these um, classical psychological concepts. For example, where is the central representation in the brain? Now, uh, for the visual system, it's a, it's a very highly uh, studied visual system, there are a couple of um, problems that arise. Um, one is the well-known divergence of the, of the uh, visual information in cortex um, into two uh, relatively separate processing stream, the ventral uh, what system and the dorsal where system. And so cells along this stream are sensitive to what's in the world, and cells along this stream are, are sensitive to where things are. And so, <clears throat> um, and it, it, furthermore, these streams diverge further. There are separate regions for analyzing color, motion, form, etc. separate regions for near and far space, uh, space within reach, space outside of reach, etc. cetera. Um, and so this raises a, a type of binding problem. Um, and, and that is really, how do you combine this information how do you create that unified representation of the world that we assume is needed as the input for this cognitive uh, system, for this central executive? Uh, and that is, uh, there's many theories about this, and there's a, a much debate about uh, how this is actually done. <clears throat> one question one might also ask is, do we actually see separate perception, cognition, and action systems in the brain? Now, we do see uh, primary sensory and motor regions, so visual pri primary visual cortex is here, primary motor cortex is here. Um, but once we step outside uh, those, those uh, zones and we go into these so-called association regions in between these, things get rather murky. Uh, for example, in many of these association regions, the earliest activity appears to encode sensory variables and later uh, change to encode motor variables. And uh, this even happens at the level of individual neurons, as if they're jumping from the perception, cognition, uh, and action boxes. Um, and a good example, actually, of this debate is the lateral and area, uh, about which you've already heard, and you'll hear uh, some more shortly uh, from Mike Shadlin, uh, I assume. Um, now, <clears throat> lateral and area areas here, and a, a, a tradition of, ex of um, experimental work has suggested that this area uh, is, it acts as a kind of an attentional filter, that it provides a, 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 a representation of the stimuli that are attended to. So that is kind of like the input to the cognitive system. But another tradition of studies has suggested that this region is in fact reflecting the intentions of the animal to produce a saccade. Uh, so that would be like the output of cognition. So how can this region be both? There's, there's now a third generation of scientists arguing this point. Um, uh, in fact, and, and many studies have shown that perhaps it's actually involved in cognition. Again, Mike Shadlin's work is, is particularly influential here. Um, so, so how can it, where does it actually belong? 
Um, where is, in fact, this central executive, this, this system that's, uh, that's uh, responsible for decisions? Um, <clears throat> well, there's neural correlates of decision-making in prefrontal and orbitofrontal cortex. <laughs> Uh, and in, as I mentioned, in parietal cortex. Um, but it's also in premotor regions, supplementary motor area, frontal eye fields, the basal ganglia, and even the superior colliculus. Now, uh, the superior colliculus is a brainstem structure that's two synapses away from the muscles that move the eye, and yet it contains many of the same kinds of um, uh, representations of, of uncertainty and, and reward value, etc., as many of these other regions. So, that's one question. Why is it so distributed? And the other question is, if we look at when these regions reflect the decision that's made, it seems to be almost everywhere at about the same time. For simple decisions, at about 150 milliseconds after the cue that tells you uh, the information uh, on how to decide, all of these regions um, reflect that. So you don't see it being passed from here to here, et cetera, et cetera. So that provides, that gives us certain neural challenges to this classical view of per serial perception cognition action system. Um, there are some, of course, conceptual challenges to this uh, computational view. Uh, one is the binding problem. Uh, another an important one is the problem of meaning. How does a computational process know the meaning of the representations that it manipulates? And so this is something that uh, John Searle spelled out very nicely in his Chinese room argument. How does the system um, actually know what it's doing if it's just doing rule-based manipulation? Uh, Stephen Harnad described this as a simple grounding problem, asking the question, how is meaning uh, associated with the symbols that we use, such as the words coming out of my mouth? Um, because these representations that are being manipulated, these descriptive representations are syntactic. They have no intrinsic meaning, uh, no intrinsic semantics, no meaning to the system that uses them. And again, usually what we mean here is an input-output system, like the Chinese room. <clears throat> so... This psychological architecture, I think, has some difficulty in if we try to now open up the brain and look at it. Um, and I'd like to make some observations, just to, just to reiterate some of the earlier points. That this model really inherits its structure from mind-body dualism. It was forced by this idea that there's something here that's non-physical. And so, since we've rejected dualism, uh, nevertheless, we have uh, inherited the architecture of dualism. Um, this idea of computation, uh, cognition as computation, was designed to primarily to explain the abstract problem-solving behavior of adult humans. That's what Newell and Simon uh, were studying, and they even explicitly said that they're not trying to explain everything about behavior. And nevertheless, the idea has been so influential, um, we use it now everywhere. And furthermore, the concepts of computation uh, were, were developed, and, and, and cognitive psychology based on those concepts, we're developed on the explicit assumption that the substrate doesn't matter. So perhaps it shouldn't be so surprising that this model and all the concepts that it developed um, have difficulty in explaining neural data. Um, <clears throat> I think another reason to question this um, model is evolution. Now, evolution consists, really rests on two key concepts. One is natural selection, which is the question of what is the selective advantage of some thing in the brain? Uh, and a lot of people um, base their theories and ask, okay, what's the selective advantage of consciousness, for example? But there's another question, another key concept that based, evolution is based on, which I think is even more valuable for us. And that is the, the descent with modification. In other words, every mechanism that we have has an ancestry. And, uh, and we, we, um, it developed gradually through uh, millions of years with certain modification. And this is actually a better source of constraints for our theory. Because you can imagine a lot of mechanisms that are advantageous, but it's, um, but it's much more limited what you can build from an existing organism. And the brain and behavior have a very long history. In fact, um, neural evolution is much more conservative, more, much more conservative than most people realize. Um, that the brain, the basic architecture of the brain, such as ventral dorsal streams uh, um, and uh, uh, cerebellar loops, etc., cetera, um, have essentially homologs way back here in animals that were um, uh, running around the world at, uh, struggling with problems that are very different than the kind of problem that cognitivism was meant to, to address. Chess playing appeared very late in evolution. 
And so I don't think we should build our basic general schematic for how the brain is organized based on this. Rather, we should be thinking about what these animals were doing. <clears throat> so this leads me back to this question of our brains input-output devices. Um, and you might say, that's a silly question. What else could they possibly be? Um, so let me ask a slightly different question first. What kinds of devices are living systems in general? Um, I mean those things very early on that evolutionary um, scale. <clears throat> well, they're control systems. So for example, uh, imagine a very simple organism here. It's, it's circular, so it's very simple. Um, suppose there is some substance, uh, A, which is necessary for this organism's survival. Now, that, system, that uh, substance is used up over time, imagine. Now, suppose there's a catalyst for creating this substance whose action is regulated inversely by the concentration of A. So in other words, if the concentration of A falls below some level, then you engage the, the biochemical reactions to produce more uh, of that substance A. And this is, of course, acts as a feedback control system. It maintains the concentration of A within acceptable ranges. And this is something that evolution can discover and exploit very easily because it exploits the consistencies in the laws of chemistry, um, the way that different um, chemicals interact. So we could call this a control system within the loop. We can call that physiology. Now, of course, you can also imagine a control system that extends beyond the skin. So now imagine now you have a substance B that you can't produce. You don't have the biomechanical, um, uh, biochemical um, machinery to produce it within the body. You need to absorb it from the world. So now imagine a different strategy, which is simply this. If the local concentration of substance B falls below some desired level, then you just move randomly, just go anywhere. And the idea of this is that this substance is non-uniformly distributed in the world. And so if you're here and you don't like that, that's not enough, then you engage some kind, of, uh, some kind of action, some kind of movement that brings you to a better location, to a place where you can absorb more of the compound B. Now this, like the previous example, is also trivial. It's extremely easy for evolution to, to discover this kind of strategy because it exploits very reliable statistics of nutrient distributions, such as, for example, that there's more food somewhere else. Um, so this is a control loop now that extends outside the skin. It's still a control loop, however, and we can call it behavior. Um, now, I would, I would claim that these kinds of motor sensory contingencies exist um, at all levels. The statistics of food distribution can be used to exploit this kind of strategy. Uh, the laws of optics and biomechanics can exploit strategies of, uh, for controlling your body. If I, con I know that if I contract my muscles a certain way when, they're in this, when I'm in this posture, I will move the image of the hand across my retina in a particular way. These are very reliable things that can be learned and exploited. Um, also, there are laws of interactions. If, if someone here in the front row suddenly shows me their teeth, I'm likely to back off. And they could use that as a, as a strategy to control my behavior as well. And I, I think animals are constantly doing this. They're constantly doing, exploiting whatever they can to bring themselves to the most desirable situation, state, full stomach, safety, etc. <clears throat> So this basic idea is, is really developed a long time ago, and it's summarized very nicely in a book by uh, Bill Powers, whose title kind of says it all, Behavior, the Control of Perception. So I want to contrast this. This is a different way of looking at behavior. Um, William James' tradition um, is given a perception, produce an action, the best action. Um, the, this, this alternative view is of the possible actions that you can produce, uh, produce that one which results in the best perception. Um, this has some advantages because it's easier to say what the best perception is. Not being eaten is a good perception. Um, and this was also uh, stated a long time ago by John Dewey, for example, who said, what we have is a circuit. The motor response determines the stimulus just as truly a sensory stimulus determines movement. Um, and this is what ethologists have been doing. While a lot of psychologists were studying um, humans and key press tasks in the lab, um, our rats running through mazes, ethologists were observing animals interacting with the world in the wild. And the kinds of things they developed were ideas about the species-specific behavioral niches that animals um, occupy and how they deal with them, how they develop strategies to exploit those niches. Um, they emphasized closed-loop sensory motor control, 
Uh, they emphasize key stimuli for releasing particular kinds of actions. So for example, instead of a full-fledged object recognition system that, that you would need before making decisions, you can actually make decisions about uh, action selection based on very simple stimuli, which animals do appear to use in the wild, because they're reliable in their niche. So this leads us to a different kind of representation. In contrast to descriptive representations, whose purpose is to capture knowledge about the world, uh, ethological theories really lead us to pragmatic, what we could call pragmatic representations. They're not so much used to capture knowledge, but to guide interaction with the world. Um, so they may be implicit. They, don't, they could be captured in the dynamics of the animal's um, interactions. They could be subjective. They could mix external reality and internal state, often correlate with many variables at once, etc. So some examples are like a salience map that tells you where things of current interest are, motor signals to the limb, as well as subject-dependent opportunities for action that the world presents you with, what James Gibson called affordances. Um, so now, one question is, can we build a kind of an architecture for behavior um, based on some of these kinds of ideas? <clears throat> uh, and, and, and I'm going to try to do that, but I'm, I'm going to use an example, which is decision-making, a, a well-studied phenomenon. So here's an example of a decision-making task um, uh, that's very well, uh, very familiar. Um, and this person here is really, he's really solving two kinds of tasks. One is the question, answering the question of what to do. In other words, which piece to move, move the queen, move, move the pawn, etc. Um, and we can call this the question of action selection. And this person is Gary Kasparov. He's actually the best human at doing this problem um, uh, of selection. But what he's also very good at is something that we're all very good at, which is how to do it. And by that, I mean the very mundane thing of which grasp point to take, how to lift it, how to move it along some trajectory to place it in some goal, etc. What we can call the specification of the spatial metrics of the action. Now, the classical model says, um, to rephrase, rephrase it, says that we select first and then we specify. We make decisions and then we plan the movement. And in this kind of task, that makes perfect sense, of course. But I would argue that it doesn't necessarily make perfect sense in the wild. Animals in the wild have to deal with a different set of constraints than a chess player. Um, so <clears throat> one thing we can observe about this situation is that the animal is presented with multiple opportunities for action. Uh, but furthermore, the actual metrics of those actions are specified by the information, let's say the visual information here. The geometry of the environment already tells this lion uh, some of the interesting directions, appetizing directions for running. Um, the affordances of the environment. Uh, but of course, he can't, he can't perform all the actions at the same time, so some selection has to happen. Um, but importantly, the real-time activity um, is constantly modifying what affordances are available as these zebra are moving, as the lion is moving. Uh, and sometimes new ones can be introduced. And so, here's an example. So here the lion, let's say, uh, has these uh, appetizing affordances available and chooses to pursue in this direction. Now, as he's doing that, of course, the other options are changing. This option is changing as well. And sometimes what was one uh, opportunity uh, splits to become two. And this is going on continuously as you're interacting with the world. So action specification and selection cannot be serial. They have to occur in parallel if you're going to be uh, effective in this kind of a scenario. Furthermore, imagine if you're a zebra now and you're running away from the lion and you're faced with this uh, environment. Now, this environment specifies two uh, opposite directions for escape. And the decision here has to be made relatively all or none, a kind of a winner take all. Go either uh, left or right. But in this kind of situation, it's quite different. Now here, your escape routes are very similar. And so it's actually not, not necessary to make the decision now. In fact, it's probably better to uh, withhold a little bit and make the decision only later. And so the sensory motor contingencies, the geometry of the actions themselves, actually should have an influence on how the selection should be done. So again, how to do these problems, um, which in the classical view would be called decision making and planning, how to do them in parallel? Um, here's an example. Let's say you want to reach an object. Um, the location of these two um, attractive objects, again, specifies the geometry, the, the parameters of potential actions that would bring you to them, bring the hand to them. Now. Uh, imagine, uh, in fact, which is 
which we know to be true, that there are cells in the brain that are sensitive to different per, uh, values of those parameters, like, for example, direction and, the, and distance of, of a movement, et cetera, or different joint angles. Uh, and so if you have a population of cells where different cells are sent, are, prefer certain directions over others, and this maps the, the entire uh, space of your possible movements, then the presence of interesting objects could be used to define activity patterns uh, in that population of cells, and those activities could represent multiple actions, like, like shown here. So now we can essentially um, make the analogy of, between this idea of specification as being implemented through the activation of parameter regions in neural populations in the sensory motor system corresponding to potential actions. A kind of probability density function um, of, of uh, uh, movements that you'll make. Uh, and then action selection, of course, is a competition because you don't want to mix these representations together. You have to do one or the other in, m in many cases. And so you could implement that j simply through lateral interactions, very similar to what Bjorn Merker was, was discussing earlier. Um, now, where could this be going on in the brain? Um, if we just take that basic idea, um, we can start looking at, let's say, visually guided movements. Um, the specification uh, system seems to be quite similar to this dorsal stream. So here cells are sensitive to spatial visual information, but it's, it's been uh, suggested that that's because they're involved in action guidance. Uh, this stream um, diverges into separate substreams, uh, as I mentioned, near versus far space, that may be actually related to different effector systems, like reaching versus locomoting, etc. Uh, along this stream, there's an increasing influence of attentional effects that, that only the most salient or interesting things um, get transformed further into different coordinate systems, different parameter spaces, still representing multiple uh, things, but maybe now multiple potential actions. Perhaps uh, this is a, a more retent topic and this is more joint-centered um, parameter spaces. And here activities related to potential motor actions, and, and we propose that there's competition between them that's biased by a variety of uh, factors. So if you have a competition, what you need now for intelligent behavior is to bias that comp competition in useful ways. And we see various biasing factors in these regions, such as attention, behavioral relevance, probability, reward, et cetera. And these biasing factors can come from many different sources. One um, promising source is the basal ganglia, which make loops with the, with the cortex uh, that are uh, more or less topo topo topographic. Um, and they appear to be involved in the selection of action and, and reward prediction and reinforcement learning, et cetera. So they, they, they contain the kind of information that you would need to bias this competition appropriately. Um, the prefrontal cortex is another very good um, potential source of these biasing signals uh, because it has the information for making uh, various kinds of high-level decisions. Um, and, and the prefrontal cortex is, and, and the basal ganglia have access to the kinds of information you need to do this intelligently, such as, for example, information from the ventral stream uh, about uh, identity of objects or simply the kinds of cues, key stimuli that ethologists um, focused on. So the idea now is that the decision actually is made through a distributed consensus among, within this uh, competitive network with a lot of bidirectional influence, etc. It is biased by all these uh, systems, which don't always agree. Of course, there could be conflict. Your basal ganglia could be telling you something, and the prefrontal cortex could be telling you something else. But in the end, you, you, the sensory motor system can really only do a couple of things at once. Now, I'm not saying that these are fully-fledged motor programs in the traditional sense, because um, of this kind of a prepared, I'm going to reach like this kind of path, but rather just enough to get the movement going, because what we're interested in is online, continuous interaction, in which you, you need to be updating your... Um, your parameters continuously through both uh, external feedback through the world and, th this is th and through the dorsal system, which is very fast, as well as through predictive feedback through forward models, which appear to involve the cerebellum. Um, so, <clears throat> and in, in the very natural behavior, all of this is going on in, in parallel. So, so just to summarize this, we call this the affordance competition hypothesis, because the basic idea is that you continuously specify the currently available potential actions or affordances, um, and they engage in a competition in the, in the sensory motor system, which is biased by a, ver a variety of, of sources, frontal and subcortical areas among them. Um, and that decision is actually made through a distributed consensus. So it's not the prefrontal cortex telling everybody what to do. The prefrontal cortex is just one loud voice 
in uh, determining um, which way the, the, the competition falls. And this provides really a different way of breaking down behavior. Rather than classifying phenomena in terms of how they uh, contribute to perception, cognition, or action, we can classify phenomena in how they contribute to these two functions, specification and selection. And so even though some of the same phenomena appear, such as decision making, um, their context is quite different. Um, and and uh, I, I think this, I would claim that this, this kind of uh, uh, taxonomy um, better represents, uh, better mirrors the, the neuroanatomy, but also it provides us a, a plausible way of thinking how these things could have evolved from each other um, in evolution, how object recognition may have evolved from the key stimulus detection that simpler animals do for their own uh, action selection purposes. So now, after all that, um, I have how much time? Five minutes? Okay, that's uh, not enough, but okay. Um, so uh, there's a couple of uh, predictions that I want to uh, describe quickly. One is that multiple potential actions can be s uh, specified simultaneously. One, that they engage in a biased competition, and that everything occurs in parallel. So um, the first one, there's been a lot of studies uh, suggesting that neural activity can specify multiple actions. I'm just going to show you one which was the subject of my um, postdoctoral work. So we trained a monkey to make reaching movements from a center to, one of, uh, to, to an outer target. And we started the task. We presented him with two targets, red and blue, in different locations around the screen. And at this point, he knew he's going to be reaching to one of these two locations. He has to memorize these. They disappear for a second. Um, they appear for a second and disappear for a second. And then we change the color of the central cue. That tells him now uh, which of those previously seen action, uh, targets he needs to move to. But he's not allowed to move yet. He has to wait for another two seconds on average. And then we give him the go signal, and he's allowed to move. So now, how would the classic model solve this problem? I think one would predict that you would store your information, some kind of working memory buffer, keep it there uh, until you get the cue, and then retrieve that information, perform some kind of a matching operation, make a decision, and then at this point plan an action. Because this is two seconds, there's plenty of time to do this. Um, the affordance competition model makes a different prediction, so that you actually specify both actions right away, and then just select one, discard one, and, and keep the other. So I'm going to just summarize the activity here. This is time, and this is cells sorted by their preferred direction. So you can see in motor cortex, at the time of the ghost signal, you get a big burst of activity of those cells that uh, move you towards the target that the monkey chose. Um, but in uh, pre-motor cortex, you see that even at the, at the time of these two targets, you see two hills of activity. As if you, you have two potential actions competing, and then the cue provides the bias that lets one suppress the other. And a number of uh, control studies uh, uh, show that this is not purely sensory uh, in from, uh, encoding. Uh, it's rather encoding what these stimuli tell you about potential movements. Um, is there a biased competition? So a, a related study done by a student, Alexander Pastor Bernier, in my lab, looked at how value plays into this. So the idea is, in the one-target version of the task, we show a single target whose border style tells the monkey how much it'll be worth. And then he's got to wait for about a second. He's given a go signal, and he makes the movement. In the two-target version, we show him two targets that are sometimes the same value, sometimes different values in different locations. Um, and then uh, in some trials, he's allowed to reach to whichever one he wants to. And in some trials, we take one away randomly and he has to reach the remaining one. But I'm not going to talk about what happens here. I'm going to talk about what happens here um, uh, before the monkey knows what's gonna, uh, whether any targets will disappear. Um, and the basic question is, is the activity in premotor cortex, uh, which seems to be related to movement, uh, modulated by value? Um, and here's a cell in the one target task. And I'm showing you here the activity of the cell when the target was always in the preferred direction and was worth either one, two, or three drops of juice. So you see, this cell does not appear to care about the value of the target, right? Um, whether it's one, two, or three drops of juice. But if we look, if we contrast the activity of this same cell in a, in a, in a task where in addition to the preferred target, there's another target somewhere else worth two rewards. Now, the cell is very strongly related to the value of the target in its preferred direction. If the preferred direction target is more uh, valuable, there's more activity than when it's less valuable. And of course, we can do the converse. We can keep the uh, preferred target uh, the same and vary the value of the other target. And then we have this inverse um, kind of interaction. So 
So you can see the cell is less active if the other target is worth three than if the other target is worth one. So this is completely what you would predict from a kind of a competition process biased by value. Uh, and in, and the, because, because there is no competition here, um, uh, the system simply doesn't, um, doesn't care about value. The bias is irrelevant. There's only one choice to be made. Another observation which I think is important is that uh, the activity of the cell is influenced not only by the value of the other target, but how far away it is. And so let me just decompose that a little bit. Here's the activity of the cell uh, as the target is being moved away when they're both worth uh, two drops of juice. But here, let's, let's look at now what happens to the relationship between the other target's value and our cell's activity um, as a function of, the, uh, of that other uh, target's value. So you can see that there's a negative, there's kind of this negative slope. But you can see that the slope becomes more and more negative as we move the targets further apart. And this is consistent across the population. The competition is strongest between cells that have the largest difference in preferred directions. Now, why, why do I think this is important? I think it's important because it suggests that the decision actually involves the sensory motor system. Right? If the decision was purely cognitive, purely a decision between I'd like to get three drops of juice and not one drop of juice, why should uh, it matter? Why should these geometrical relationships matter to the monkey? Um, but we find that they do. The dynamics of the competition, which we believe determines the choice, depend on the spatial relationship between the movements themselves. And I think the reason for this is, is, is this reason, that when you're making decisions between two diametrically opposed movements, you need to have a lot of competition. You need to have a strong winner-take-all. Whereas here, the competition does not need to be as strong. In fact, it's better to delay the decision a little bit. The final prediction is that things happen in parallel. This, the, this hypothesis suggests that, that we're uh, specifying movements and selecting and, and doing all these things in parallel. Animals are constantly interacting with the world, evaluating different options, deciding whether to persist or, or, or switch. Uh, and, specific and specification and selection must normally occur in parallel. But, of course, that's not what we do in the lab. We don't actually let our monkeys run around freely for technical reasons. Um, uh, but if we, if we put them in a chair and we give them this kind of task, it's a, remember, it's a very artificial task. It's not what the animal evolved to do. For example, time in this task is broken into these discrete trials, each of which begins with a stimulus and ends with a response. That's not normal behavior, but the animal can deal with it. The other thing is the stimulus is deliberately made independent from the response. We've broken that control loop, which, which Dewey suggested was a whole basis of, of behavior. But nevertheless, the animal can deal with this. The question is, what do we expect this system to do in that condition. What we expect, I think, is this. A fast feed-forward sweep along the dorsal stream, which is very fast, presenting simply where things are, where the interesting things are, where the sort of the prepotent responses might be. Uh, and activity at this stage will look very sensory. But if we give it a little more time for the slower processes to engage, then they'll start to sculpt this activity, this competition, to reflect cognitive variables, reward, etc., uh, and look more and more like a prediction of what the monkey will do. Uh, and many studies have shown this. I'm just going to summarize one here by Ledberg and others who recorded simultaneously local field potentials from the cerebral cortex of a couple of monkeys in a task where they could distinguish certain kinds of events occurring in the brain. So, and they saw exactly these two waves of activity. A fast feed-forward sweep, primarily in the dorsal system, uh, including a motor and premotor cortex, within 50 milliseconds of stimulus appearance. So this is stimulus appearance. This is 50 milliseconds later. And then... Uh, and that was relatively fast, especially in the dorsal stream. And then um, the monkey's decision appeared. You could distinguish the monkey's decision about 150 milliseconds after the stimulus. Again, in a lot of regions at once, these gray bars show where it was statistically significant. And you know, interestingly, you see it often, uh, and in some other experiments as well, appearing in, in dorsal premotor and, and, and other of these sort of sensory motor regions before prefrontal, for example. So let me just summarize the experimental data. Um, simultaneous specification of multiple potential actions. I've shown you data from PMD, but there's also data from parietal reach region and M1 for arm reaching system, for grasping system in anterior and intraparietal and PMV, uh, the saccade system in area LIP, um, in the frontal eye fields, the sphere folliculus, etc. And the idea of the biased competition is that it's actually the, the competition that determines decisions happening in the sensory motor system, influenced by a variety of biasing factors. Now, interestingly, biased competition is uh, mechanistically, mathematically, very similar to attention, to models of attention by uh, Duncan and Desimo, suggesting, and as they have, 
that perhaps uh, they're both aspects of the, the ultimate selection problem that the animal has to do. And attention is selection near the sensory end of things, and decision is selection near the effector, the effectors. And that the influences depend on geometry, as we showed, suggests that decisions are not simply abstract. They're actually influenced by the geometry, uh, the, the sensory motor contingencies. They're pragmatic representations, not descriptive. And they mix things like direction of movement, value, effort, idiosyncratic preferences, etc. And decisions made through a distributed consensus. Um, and then, of course, the, the idea that this is all happening in parallel. So now, backing out further to the larger questions, the theoretical concept, the affordance competition hypothesis is, is uh, suggested as, as an um, alternative to this classical perception, cognition, action, serial view. Um, and instead, we have parallel systems. And I would claim that this provides a better match to neural data and that it may be better suited, in fact, to the kinds of tasks that dominated animal behavior throughout evolution. And in fact, this is actually quite similar to the kinds of architectures that people have developed in autonomous robotics research. And I, I, I think the emphasis should be on pragmatic representations, that neural activity that is aimed not merely at, not, not specifically at describing the world, but at mediating interaction with the world, uh, and therefore correlates with many of these variables um, and various mixtures, such as spatial direction with reward values. So the conjecture is that most, although of course not all, neural activity is this pragmatic kind. And in fact, one could go so far to say that descriptive representations that capture knowledge and perhaps exist in in prefrontal or ventral stream, emerge later in evolution as specializations of pragmatic rep representations uh, that allow more advanced selection. And the, the idea that cognitive abilities evolved through the hierarchical elaboration of the same system, of this kind of um, com biased competition system, through so diversification of frontal parietal, corticostriatal, and corticocerebral loops, which appear to be uh, repeated as you go front in the brain as it expanded and deal with more and more abstract systems. This really echoes a point made by Piaget long ago that interaction lays the foundation for cognition. So the philosophical implications, um, one is that the proposal, there is really no central executive, that at least for, for decisions, this is something that emerges. Um, it leads us to see these classic problems in different contexts. The binding problem, certain kinds of binding problems uh, are, are, are trivial simply because the, the ac activity of these different systems is bound through interacting with the same world. And the symbol grounding problem, I think, is, is, is much easier because uh, interaction has meaning by virtue of influencing the variables critical for life. That's where the motivation for all this comes from. And symbols are just a, a specialization, like shorthand notation within that system. So rather than ask how meaning is attached to symbols, what we should ask, I think, is how symbols evolve within, an, uh, within a system for um, meaningful interaction. And the hard problem, uh, I can't really say too much about the hard problem, uh, except that clearly uh, we, we should understand why feeling is different than, than doing, uh, because it's very different to be inside the control loop than observing it from the outside. So this echoes some of the points made uh, by others, uh, including here, um, as well as the, uh, the, the idea, the ethological idea of the Umwelt. And so I just want to finish up with the suggestion that um, the computer metaphor, uh, with all due respect to Alan Turing, may be a misleading model for the brain. That what we really need to focus on, I think, is control. The fact that the brain is actually controlling its input. Uh, it's not something that computers do. Uh, and that is because the great, uh, in the words of uh, Thomas Huxley, the great end of life is not knowledge but, a but action. Uh, or if you prefer, in the words of the rock band REM, your head is there to move you around. Uh, thanks.